from Sivia that her uh, her Wi-Fi went down, so we'll try to get her back in. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. I'm Drew. Uh, this is the Fugues uh, Cloud Security Masterclass, where we're all about putting engineers in command of cloud security. Uh, we've got an awesome session today. I'm excited about it. Corey Quinn is joining us. Uh, you can probably see him on the screen. Um, you probably know him from the Screaming at the Cloud in the Cloud podcast uh, last week in AWS newsletter. Of course, Quinny Pig on Twitter. We're super excited to have him here. Uh, before I turn it over to my colleague, Josh Stella, to kick things off, just have a few announcements. Uh, we will get these posted into chat. Uh, Sivia usually does that. I will make sure I do that if she's not back on in time. Um, in December, we're going to be doing another masterclass session. This one is on pen testing your cloud. So we all know pen testing is a critical component of any security program, but few people realize that cloud misconfiguration attacks rarely play a role in pen testing efforts and they really need to be. So join us for that and uh, we'll help you figure out what that means, how to make sure your pen test vendors or professionals are incorporating these kind of attack vectors in your uh, pen test efforts. Um, we do have a growing library of past cloud security masterclass sessions available on demand, S3 security, IAM, serverless, you can access those at fugue.co slash masterclass. And also, if you haven't downloaded your free copy of the Engineer's Handbook on Cloud Security, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and do that right after this session is over. You can find that at fugue.co slash handbook. All right, so chat is now open at any time during the session. If you have any questions for Corey or Josh, go ahead and pop those into the chat. Or if you just have any snarky comments, we want to make this session maybe a little extra snarky. So uh, does that apply to me? You, I, I don't think no, you can no, use no the chat, can you? <laughs> no snark from you. <laughs> Yours is verbal snark today. They, they, everybody Fair else can, uh, can, can pop that into chat. Um, so, but it's open now and always. So uh, keep those in and I will interject uh, where I deem necessary to, uh, to pose questions to Corey and Josh. So, uh, Josh, Corey, welcome. Uh, why don't you kick this off, Josh? Right on. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Drew. Welcome, Corey. Welcome, everyone who's joined us today. We're only going to do a handful of slides because slides are pretty boring. Uh, just set the agenda and go over just a high Oh, good. Level. You said it so I don't have to. Yes, they are. I hate them, but you need them a little bit. So we got, I think, what do we have, three? Uh, three or four. Anyway, um, this is the agenda. I'm going to set the table on cloud security. Corey and I are going to talk about this topic and related topics. Q&A we have here as at the end, but we like it better when it's all during because these things are much more fun if folks are interacting on them and you know help us guide the conversation. Um, can I get a raise of hands for people who have attended our master classes before? Okay, it, it looks like we got, we got a few, but we have more that haven't. Uh, you can go ahead and lower your hands. So one of the things we like to do, uh, we all used to go to trade shows and get swag. We no longer go to trade shows, but we think it's fun to still give away some swag and to do that in hopefully a fun way. So several times during this session, I'm gonna change my Zoom background to something out of geek culture. And what I mean by geek culture is stuff I like and I hope I have something in common with you. It'll be things like the history of computing, uh, animes, video games, science fiction. An AWS bill. I'm sorry? An AWS bill. An AWS bill. <laughs> We're gonna be, uh, try to be more like uh, uh, fun than, uh, than uh, slightly terrifying in this. All right. Well, that's everything gonna... this side of a root canal. <laughs> I'm gonna throw it up behind me. And the first person to name what it is, like the name of the computer, the uh, name of the video game, the name of the show or movie, anime, whatever, is going to win a t-shirt we're going to send to you. Sivy is going to take care of that. Uh, so you'll, you'll chat against, uh, you'll send that, that into the chat, send it to everybody. First person who guesses it right or knows it wins. And then you can only win once per class. So if you win one, uh, don't do it anymore. Don't guess anymore because you could spoil it for others. All right, I'm gonna do my first background now. We're gonna do a few of these over the course of this session. Oh, 
and it's going up on the wrong screen again. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm going to start with, hmm, let's start with something uh, highly relevant in the world of video gaming as of uh, last week. What is this game? I'm going to do my Vanna White here, but I can't really. What is this game? It's not Spider-Man, although that is a good guess. It's not Grand Theft Auto, not Infamous. Minecraft. It's not Minecraft. Well, I mean, it could be like really high resolution Minecraft. Uh, not Watch Dogs, uh, think uh, Japanese. Released last week on the, new, on the new console generation. All right, I don't think we're gonna get it. I'm gonna move on. Um, we'll do more. Uh, I, I now understand that maybe this is not a uh, a uh, uh, super video game oriented audience uh, will pick out some uh, history of computing next. Uh, so you'll have more chances, but um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, yeah, Tristram's not a gamer for sure. Okay, um, a little just background on cloud security. I'm not gonna read through these one by one. Really what I wanna set the stage for here, and, th and this is the context of the conversation between Corey and I, although it's gonna, it's gonna deviate from this, I guarantee. Uh, but this is uh, some major things to think about in cloud security. Uh, the main attack surface in the cloud is misconfiguration of resources and combinations of resources having configurations that are dangerous. And in many cases, those uh, risk, those attack surfaces, the vectors the hackers are really using are um, not really covered by the compliance standards like CIS or NIST or GDPR or HIPAA. Uh, those things are good, you need those. But a lot of the dangerous stuff is not handled uh, by those things or pointed out by those things. And therefore, they go unnoticed uh, by security teams. They go unnoticed um, you know, in the actual environment. A lot of times, these can only be seen in full context, not just in, for example, infrastructure as code. Uh, and that makes them really common. And often, they are exploitable without detection. Uh, one of the hacks Corey and I talked about uh, recently uh, well, I guess a year ago was the Capital One hack. They didn't know about it until uh, the, uh, the hacker bragged on social media. So that's what we mean by exploitable without detection. And there are a lot of these things happening outside of your pipeline uh, all the time. So you might be using a Terraform pipeline or CloudFormation IAC pipeline. Uh, in every case I've seen, folks are also going into the console or things like that. All right, and just a reminder, we might be talking at times about the shared responsibility model. Uh, so I'm throwing it up here. The shared responsibility model is uh, is is basically there's some garbage. Stuff. <laughs> no, uh, and I, to be serious, I, I'm gonna be, yeah. be slightly serious, but observational at the moment here. The reason the shared responsibility model uh, is so complicated is not because it's complex itself. Fundamentally, what it states is that. If you wind up handle the security parts of it, AWS handles the configuration parts of it, the customer handles. What that fundamentally means is that if there's a security breach, it is a near certainty that you screwed up. Now that's not a 45 minute talk and you need a 45 minute talk when you're explaining to a customer that they are the ones who have screwed the metaphorical pooch. So they need to be able to cloak this in something a bit more nuanced and complicated looking. And we call it the shared responsibility model because why it's your fault is never quite as compelling when speaking to customers. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very true. Uh, and, and I think also what's, it, what's important for folks to understand is how much of it is their responsibility, right? I've, I've talked to folks who think that, well, I'm on the cloud and AWS is handling a lot of the security for me, uh, but in fact, as you just pointed out, Corey, like every configuration of everything in the cloud is all on you. So um, this is this is where cloud breaches happen. I'm gonna jump out of slides now and we'll just get into a conversation a little more. So Corey, uh, I'm thrilled to have you on, on our class series. I think the last- As you should be, we, I'm delightful. <laughs> the last time we spoke at length was uh, when you had me on your podcast uh, talking about the Capital One hack, which I really enjoyed. Um, you enjoyed the podcast, you enjoyed the hack? Uh, both. Excellent. Well, I Excellent. enjoyed simulating the hack. I didn't enjoy that it happened to Capital One, but I enjoyed uh, kind of recreating it. Yeah, one yeah, of the sad so parts is, is Capital One hasn't gone on to talk about that in any meaningful way. Every time it's brought up, they, they shut down. Like they're the cloud security groundhog now. Whenever you bring up their, uh, their breach, that turns into six more weeks of not talking about cloud security. Uh, 
I, I also have noticed that. And I, I'll point out that, you know, a, a counterpoint to that was um, the Imperva breach, where the CTO went and put a blog post up saying ex what happened, exactly how it happened, and what they're doing to mitigate it. And as somebody who works in security and cloud, I really appreciate that because it gives us, you know, information that we can help our customers with. Yeah, we all learn from mistakes. And I do want to call out to their credit, once again, Capital One did not screw up the way that most people screw up of, oops, you mean when I say all authenticated users, it means anyone in AWS entirely, not just who work here. It wasn't that. It was a complex series of exploits chained together. It was very clever. Did they make mistakes? Sure, of course. But these are in-depth mistakes, not one of those, I forgot to read the giant six foot tall flaming letters of warning and did it anyway. Exactly. Hey, I was remiss before before we keep diving in. Uh, Corey, uh, I, I'm sure most of our audience knows who you are, but um, uh, can, you, you describe yourself as the chief cloud economist. Can you can you share with our audience who aren't familiar with you, kind of what you do and. Sure, I, I fix horrifying AWS bills, which is a small problem that afflicts eventually everyone in the fullness of time. It started off as me spending 15 years in engineering work and getting bored with that and trying to see if I can do something else. Along the way, I started the last week in AWS newsletter that gathers the news from Amazon's ecosystem and then gently and lovingly makes fun of it. And I do this on Twitter. I do it in a couple of podcasts, screaming in the cloud in the AWS morning brief. And this all really comes down to the fact that growing up, the first language spoken at home was sarcasm. And it turns out that bringing personality to the world of cloud billing is pretty easy to do because there isn't a lot of personality already there. In fact, if you gaze long enough into the AWS bill, it sucks out not only the contents of your bank account, but also your soul. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, that's, that, that's kind of true in a lot of places in our industry. People are so serious all the time. And uh, I, I really think, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it kind of rings some of the joy uh, out of uh, computing. And, and that's a lot of why I got into it when I was a kid. I thought this is really cool. This is fun. And uh, the seriousness of the industry always kind of leaves me a little bemused uh, when uh, you know you, you can do great stuff and be smart and not be a stick in the mud or just dry as toast. Our ethos is that the world of cloud takes itself too seriously. We aim to change that. Right on. So I think uh, over the years of doing all of that work that you're describing, you've probably seen some common mistakes that are made in the cloud both from a billing perspective, but I suspect even though it's not your focus from a security perspective as well. Oh, the confluence of those two are great. When we'll talk to a customer and great, can you tell us what all those instances in the Australia region are doing? Oh, we don't have anything in the Australia region. I believe you are being sincere when you say that. However, and now we're playing security experts, which is not a great thing. I mean, it turns out that when we actually try and sell security projects on a lark, everything that makes us sound awesome as a bill analysis company sounds like crap in the security space. We partner with no other companies in this space. Oh, because you're prideful morons is the security answer. On the billing side, it's, oh, so you have no conflict of interest. Different story. It, the, the talking points don't quite align piece to piece, but I dabbled in InfoSec for a while, got the hell out of it because it turns out that the community at the time was a toxic shithole. Whether it still is or not, I don't know. I mostly stay away from those people. So, you know, it's interesting <clears throat> that what's, I, what I see is happening in security right now is traditionally there was InfoSec on the one side and there was like developers and ops folks on the other side. And what, what's happening in, from our perspective is that security is getting embedded into the development process. So where in the past, it was just like monitoring after the fact and putting boundaries around things. Now it's kind of getting baked in and therefore in cloud, it really is an important first class citizen for engineers because you know in the old days to build a big network globally would take months or years of procurement and racking things. So I can do it in a few minutes this morning in the cloud. Well, I will challenge you on that a little bit. If it's, I'd lo everyone loves to talk about how the practice of security getting baked in has evolved and we're seeing all these changes. If that's true, then why has the OWASP 10 vulnerabilities list not meaningfully changed in a decade? Yeah, well, that's a, a good point. Um, so really what I'm referring to is the infrastructure kinds of misconfigurations. And what you see a lot on the cloud is not so much the traditional 
penetrate a network, get to a vulnerability in an application or an operating system. Those things are there. But most of these breaches are actual uh, exploitations of cloud API access. And those things are very controllable from an engineering perspective uh, and without the complexity actually in some ways of the kind of team you need to assemble. Like if you build a VPC the right way and you handle IAM the right way, God help you, uh, wh whatever that means. Um, you know, we, we, we have opinions about it at few because we do this for a living. Then you're going to have a much better, you know, uh, a, a much less vulnerable surface uh, if you engineer it right. But you really can't put a firewall around it. There is truth to that, for better or worse, and it doesn't help with the S3 story that it was designed to simultaneously be this ultra secure vault for your company's secrets, and also this publicly serve facing static website service. It seems like those are two very dangerous things to put together, like effectively a dog grooming uh, brush that also serves as an incredibly sharp meat slicer. Maybe don't combine those two things. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you say that. I mean, S3 is kind of the, the web server in the sky and it can slice dice and, and you know, and, and, and brush your dog. What, what we see a fair amount of too are people aren't aware of things like when you do snapshots, those end up in S3. And so one attack vector that is actually relatively common is uh, a hacker gets access to uh, uh, snapshots in S3 extracts uh, API keys from them and then goes and has fun in the runtime environment. So that it still drives me nuts when I do it at the command line and AWS EC2 describes snapshots. It sits there for a minute as the computer thinks it's, hmm, I don't think I have that many. And then the torrent hits of every public snapshot that it can see of, hmm, you think that would require a flag or something or rather than, and now 18 megabytes of text coming streaming down to fill your console with crap. And I look at some of these things and it's less so these days, but there were some concerning, some concerning terms like production database backup. Uh, that doesn't seem ideal, now does it? No, indeed. And, well, and that, that brings up, well, uh, Tristan made a comment here. He said, agreed network VPC, et cetera, are important, but IAM and S3 misconfigurations are just as important to avoid. Uh, I would argue more important to avoid. Uh, if, you're, if, you, if somebody gets into your compute instances or your containers, you, you are still going to see TCP IP network over your boundaries. If somebody gets access to S3 via IAM, a lot of that activity happens on the API control plane and on the back channel at AWS. And that means all your IDSs and all that stuff aren't going to help you really there. And they can run one command called sync and uh, blow away a whole lot or steal a whole lot of your data. Um, and Tristan says exactly. All right, I'm going to take a break and do a background again. I promised we would do that and not do another video game. All right. Why does this keep popping up on this screen? I want it on this one. I'm just going to leave it up. All right, let's do history of computing. So name this computer. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, it is no longer a computer company, but it was extremely important in modern computing. Kubernetes, Mark One. Uh, okay, we got we got two answers. One is right. Uh, someone said Whopper. It's it's not Whopper, uh, but it is uh, uh, Gare. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, it is a Xerox. This is the uh, Xerox Alto, uh, which was the first. Um, it, it was really neat what was going on at Xerox Park at the time. If you if if you're not a graybeard like me, you might not be as familiar with the story. Uh, a real walk at the Xerox Park. Here we go. Uh, yeah, briefly. Uh, they pretty much invented uh, the use of the mouse, the graphical, graphical user interface, Ethernet, uh, and a number of other things there. It's arguably, uh, Smalltalk was the first real object-oriented language by Alan Kay developed there as well. So some really cool stuff out of, of all places, Xerox. Okay, we got a winner. Let's move on. So. Um, have you seen much change in how people are using cloud in the kind of COVID era? There's been a lot of press on this. And I often wonder, I have my own perspective from our customers, but I wonder what you've seen. There's a lot that's changing. It 
in the early days, it was one of those, wow, why is the VPN melting is always a good question. It turns out when you spec something, imagining at most 10% of your company is going to be using it at once, and then 100% of people are using it full time, you haven't set up split tunneling, which is a whole separate security discussion, and suddenly everyone's doing everything through the corporate network, things catch on fire. Now, we're mostly past that as people have figured out how to work around that, but people are also waking up to a reality that whether people were in your offices or whether people are sitting at home, they're still telecommuting into wherever the computers happen to live. So there's a lot of questions arising about what the future of this is going to look like. I don't necessarily uh, believe that all work is going to be remote forevermore. There is a certain high bandwidth value in having face-to-face -face conversations with people. I'm a hell of a lot more polite when I could actually get punched in the face in real time for what I said. That's harder to pull off full remote, not impossible, just harder. The, so what I'm seeing is that folks are definitely looking into what does it mean when everything lives somewhere else, VPNs may not be the way forward anymore. What about the idea of beyond corp or zero trust where everything becomes an authenticated API call? Then we take a look at people's modern day ideas of authentication of being a password of kitty that they wind up writing on a post-it note, sticking to their laptop and taking it through airports everywhere. Oh, and they're the CEO. So people talk about making transformative sort of moves. People do things differently than they describe. I think that it definitely accelerates cloud adoption, but I don't think it's this watershed moment that means that the future is cloud where it wasn't before. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting point to me in that uh, I think it's forced people to realize, as you said, everything is actually remote. As soon as you're using cloud uh, and, and, and channeling everything through VPNs is probably not the way to go uh, because it's thinking old in the, in the old technologies where there was a perimeter. Where there were well, no see, you say that, but earlier this week, they came out with the AWS managed firewall, or they may have called it something else. That's what I think of it as, which is what people were asking for 10 years ago. And their response was, no, you learn how security groups and IAM work. And you're, if you try and port your network architecture from yesteryear into so the cloud today, you're going to have a bad time. The lesson we learn from this is when AWS tells you to learn something new, if you scream and cry and kick your feet and kick up a fuss for a decade, they'll eventually meet you where you are. It bothers me that it exists on some level. The, my consolation prize is that it's six and a half cents per gigabyte you put through it. So that'll fix people's little red wagon. It just means that fundamentally it's going to be ex continually expensive to do things the wrong way rather than impossible. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, twist the dial all the way up on the price point for that. Yeah. You have yeah. to make it painful or people will never change. Yeah, well, I, I, mean, I wish I could say otherwise, but that's not the most uplifting narrative, but it's true. It Again, true. look at it this way. People talk about how important security was to their company right after they demonstrated very publicly that security was not particularly important to them. It's lip service and the horse has frolicking and fallen and slaughtered and is now AWS glue. And now you're talking about how important security was. Great, bring out the sacrificial CISO to fire. <laughs> Yeah, what we encourage people to do is to think about, yes, you're going to have TCP IP networks, right? Those are going to exist. You're going to have subnets and so on. But really, IAM is the new network. IAM done properly and security groups. When you think about uh, composing an application with uh, profiles and roles, for example, Fugue is built mostly out of lambdas. And each of those lambdas needs to only have via IAM access to the appropriate other lambdas or data persistence tiers or what have you. So when you, when you graph that out, what you really have is effectively a network. I think a lot of people get intimidated by IAM for a good reason, which is the number of actions in AWS is um, highly uh, variant based on the service. So EC2, I think has 400 some actions and quite confusing. So people kind of throw out their hands. Yeah. Last year, there was an IAM managed policy that I took a look at. It goes, that doesn't seem right. I opened a security incident with AWS and they fixed it. Turns out, yeah, I was right. And I gave a talk about this at reInvent last year, back when that was a thing people went to in person. And it was a it was a great experience of how they handled it internally, how they triaged it, how they handled communication with me. And I appreciated them for doing that. But if they can't get it right with all of their vaunted provable security, what chance do the rest of us have? I often say, if I weren't focusing on AWS bills, there's a services market out there for someone to become the, uh, the best known person in IAM security. 
yeah, I'm going to come in and charge your company a hundred grand. And if I don't find something provably broken and dangerous in your IAM configuration, I'll give 80 grand of it back to you. I feel like I would never have to write a refund check ever because there's always something out there. Now, it, the hard part about this is always, and I see it with the bill side, is convincing people of that. But if I had said this to Capital One, for example, right before their breach, they would have laughed me out of the room and told me to get, get lost. In hindsight, that would have been the best money they could have possibly spent. So there's a, it's one of those people only value it after they should have valued it problem. How do you make a security a number one priority? It doesn't help me ship things any faster. It doesn't, uh, uh, this face, save me any money up front. And it just looks like it's a colossal pain in the ass. Besides, I'm a small company. No one would care enough to break into what I do. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, a venture capitalist once told me, you know, you need to sell aspirin, not vitamins. Uh, put another way, you know, convincing people to do something good for them if they're not experiencing pain is really hard to do. And that's a fundamental challenge of being a security vendor. I think our approach has been, uh, you know, we, we, we try to make it kind of fun. We try to give people nice interfaces and make it I easy. I do too. I'm at a point now where instead of telling, sending people polite messages when I find an open S3 bucket, I just copy an absolute shit ton of data into it under the theory that they might ignore my polite email, but they're not going to ignore a $4 million bill. <laughs> oh man, I'm kidding. Don't do this. It's probably a felony. Yeah, I, I would suggest, recommend not, not to do that for sure. So you, you mentioned CISOs. How do you view the CISO in the era of cloud? What, what is their job? What should be their job? Uh, those are two different questions and uh, <laughs> two different answers at least. Uh, what is their job? Um, cannon fodder. Uh, when you have someone uh, very high up, you can publicly fire when they get it wrong. Because let's not kid ourselves. For most product development, most operational stories, how much does InfoSec really have a seat at the table? Only in very mature organizations to be direct. It's There's so much ridiculousness out there as far as ways to leave holes out from the configuration story. And I can't entirely blame them either. I've seen a couple of consultancies put out these, uh, how to use all of these AWS security services and to wind up protecting yourself against breach, misconfiguration, the rest. And I'm looking at these services because I am who I am. And I'm looking at this and what is the cost of a breach? Because I can tell you what the cost of all of those services is, and it is not at all clear to me that there's a clear winner from a costing perspective here. It's these are incredibly complicated in terms, and when I say expensive, I don't just mean the cost of services. I mean the engineering overhead of getting all this stuff configured, and then some poor schmoo has to have this all stuck into their head so that they can understand what the hell lives in their environment. And that is an incredible cognitive burden too. Now CISOs ideally need to be the advocate for InfoSec and their team in the, at, at the executive level to talk about why security is important. But it sounds an awful lot like um, being paranoid of being chicken little where the sky is falling, the sky is falling. It's, well, yeah, but nothing bad's happened yet. What's the problem? I don't need to wear a mask or a seatbelt. And only after it's too late do people realize the value of these things. Uh, yeah, could, could, couldn't agree more. I mean, I think from my perspective, having I'm mostly a software architect and developer, not an infosec guy. So, uh, but I've no, I can tell you're not you're not an infosec guy. You're polite. Please continue. <laughs> uh, I, I built a lot of national security oriented systems over the years, and and I've been very security focused in how I've done things. Uh, my my belief is that what we really need to do that software is kind of eating the world, if you will, and that if if we can have the same kind of tooling that a compiler provides for programming that gives you errors and so on that you can respond to as an engineer, as a programmer, if you can do the same for security, that we might start actually solving this. But as long as we've got, uh, as you said, a, 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 you know, somebody who has to keep all this stuff in their head, we can't keep it in your head. It's like keeping a phone book in your head. You know, that's why humans invented maps, why we invented alphabets. Giant long enumerations of things are not human consumable. It needs to be uh, oriented toward how humans think, how they process information and, and make it obvious, you know. Um, that is an amazing argument of why, uh, that explains the eventual supremacy of YAML over JSON. Please continue. <laughs> oh boy, don't get me started. I, I, I hate both. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, XML I, is the one true language, but apparently whenever I say that, the pitchforks come out. Uh, it, uh, I hate it equally. You know, I prefer actual languages that can give you meaningful feedback and you don't have to be overly worried about syntax. Okay. We've got a couple of comments, questions here I want to bring up. 
Um, Eliana says, uh, having just written about 100 least privileged IAM policies for Terraform in the last quarter, I appreciate this discussion of how complex they are. There are actually significant gaps in AWS IAM features right now that make implementing least privilege very difficult. That is true. If you haven't looked at it, uh, one uh, uh, kind of band-aid layer, which is actually pretty powerful, is the attribute-based access controls. Uh, oh. I, would I would advocate looking at that versus putting resource names in everything. Uh, but yeah. I'm gonna I mean, argue that one. Sorry, I, I oh, have yeah. to throw a flag on that. The idea of now tags wind up becoming a way of uh, identifying security. Well, that's what the managed IAM uh, uh, policy problem that I found was. It's for years now, we have been saying tag everything, tag everything, tag everything to developers because until this came out, there was no security implication to this. It was a way of allocating costs and no one ever does that voluntarily, but you keep trying and failing and everyone and everything can write tags and congratulations. Uh, InfoSec policy nightmare goes brr and here we are. That's an interesting point. So you're saying that, that because those tags can be modified by uh, a lot of folks by necessity because of the use of tags, that attribute-based access control is vulnerable to anyone who has access to modifying those tags. Did I yes, because in a greenfield environment, it's fine. Don't get me wrong on that. My problem is, is that any company with a large enough estate to really worry about is probably not spun up their account in the last two years. It's been existing for a long time. And oh, yeah. there's a lot of things scattered throughout the environment that are going to cause security problems that people aren't aware exists. Um, common example, like the number one uh, entry point for a breach in any environment is invariably going to be the Jenkins box because that's not infrastructure as code. It's always written by hand. It's overpowered. It can touch right. everything and no one's really sure who does what on it. But other than that, it's awesome. <laughs> Interesting points. Um, all right, a question from uh, Jam. Uh, how oh, do you hi, Jam. Continue? Do you know Jam? Okay. Oh, I know Jam Ossley. They were one of my guest authors when I was out on parental leave. Oh, very nice. They wrote uh, an amazing, question, amazing your... post, but please continue. Uh, we, we, we did get a question earlier. How's, how's your new baby doing? Oh, uh, she is sleeping through the night, which is not a sympathetic thing to tell any parent anywhere. Don't at me. Yeah, I'm jealous. Uh, it's been a little while for me. So uh, the question from Jam, how do you constantly map something that is constantly changing? Uh, that is hard. Uh, it's one of the kind of fundamental problems we try to tackle at Fugue. The answer is you, you need to understand what your sample rate is. You, it's just like if you go to uh, you know, a Google map of, uh, of the world, it is being updated at some frequency uh, in a constantly changing world. You have to decide the, 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 the resolution in terms of the time period. And what we've chosen to do is make that variable based on the use case, based on uh, the customer requirements and so on. So for example, within Fugue, we, we do these automated mappings, visual mappings. Um, you can run, uh, get a, a sample rate once a day, or you can get a sample rate once every 10 minutes um, and you can play back history. So there, there are choices to be made there because uh, it's like the uh, arguments about the uh, uh, simulation hypothesis, right? If, if the computer understands everything about what's going on, it's an infinite amount of memory that it has to consume and it's made of that. You have the same kind of circle. Yeah, if you squint hard enough, the AWS billing system could be considered to be a map. It's a list at least of everything running in your environment. And those cost and usage reports have at best an eight hour latency uh, period between you spin something up and it shows up in that report. So the idea of doing anything real time that touches anything in AWS, there's always gonna be a convergence consistency issue at some point. The, the question is with what you're doing, what is the acceptable latency and trade-off here? Now here in the real world where we build architecture diagrams by hand, uh, the latency on what's actually running and what's on the architecture diagram is measured in months or years. Yeah. And every once in a while I'll go through and update it. And it's always aspirational because trying to show certain views. One-to-one -one, uh, representation of everything in the environment and a map becomes indistinguishable from the environment itself. There's always yep. trade-offs that you're going to make. Now, yeah, exactly. how do you continually map it? Well, world's worst intern project is uh, answer one to that, but there's there are better tools for that, which is what I believe Fwage does. I also believe Fwage is how it's pronounced. Yes, Fugue does do that. Although we will take under consideration uh, uh, changing the pronunciation to Fwage. Uh, yeah, so what our approach to this is pretty straightforward, uh, theoretically, and hard to do in practice. Uh, it is that if any 
uh, uh, data is available via APIs in the cloud, whether it's AWS or Azure, Google, uh, that's spelled F-W-A-G-H-E. No, F-U-G-U-E. Um, so, uh, You're data, almost as salty as the Postgres squeal database people. <laughs> and the GitHubs are just ridiculous, but I digress. Please continue. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so any data element that's available on those APIs, like describe calls or what have you, we just collect all of that for everything you point us at. And then when we visualize things, we make a lot of decisions about what to portray and what view. So similarly to like a Google map, you zoom in, you get more detail, you zoom out, you get more uh, kind of broader topology. All right, um, let's do, was it 37? No, we'll go a little longer. So what do you think about, you know, it's funny, a couple of years ago, we were hearing constantly about hybrid cloud. And I'm hearing less about that these days. What's your perception of that? My perception is, is that you, for whatever reason, haven't been algorithmically sorted into uh, being targeted for ads by IBM. Uh, that said, there's hybrid has always been a weird thing because when you talk to people and look at what they say when they start a cloud journey or digital transformation or setting money on fire project, they always talk about going all in on cloud. And at some point they realize that it's hard. They're, they have a mainframe and there is no AWS 400 as of the time of this live stream. So, okay, they have to make compromises and they just give up on some workloads. They declare victory, call it multi-cloud, plant a flag and they're done. And I'm sympathetic to that approach. I, it's hard to migrate things. The problem with hybrid as anything other than an intermediary step in some of its expressions is that you are improving your data center environment at the expense of your cloud environment. And what you're doing is really treating the cloud as just another data center, only more expensive and more difficult to master than your existing environment. I struggle to really see extreme levels of value from that approach in the common case. There are exceptions out the wazoo, don't at me. Well, okay, so so what you're describing there is hybrid cloud as a consequence of you know practical decisions that we've got a mainframe, we need to keep it. What I was more referring to is this kind of, we're gonna adopt a strategy of hybrid cloud where we're gonna have some API level lingua franca across public cloud infrastructure in our data centers. And you see it mostly these days with Kubernetes where people are trying to create and we saw it before with Stratius and other things like that before Dell bought and strangled them. Yeah, there's a there's a whole bunch of different takes on this. But the idea of and the same argument comes against multiple cloud providers where I'm going to build this abstraction layer that lets me interact with everything the same way. It doesn't work. It yeah. winds up giving you only a common subset of things in, in your private data in your data center or private cloud, if we listen to the marketers on that one, then it's it's a very limited subset of what you can do. And your capability is just not there in the same way. Well, it's a limited subset, but even among that subset, the the behavioral patterns are different. So, uh, you know, it, oh, yeah. how does spin up a uh, spin up a managed uh, database system or a load balancer. GCP and AWS have different uh, failure modes, different response times, different ways that gets provisioned. And you have to wind up either abstracting around that or, or narrowing that down to a more common case. Eventually, if you're doing a lot of extensive work with load balancers, your answer becomes, well, hell with it. I'll just spin up instances and run my own version of HA proxy or Nginx on top of it. At which point, what are you doing? Your yeah. competitor is not spending time doing that. They're ideally, they're doing whatever it is that makes money. And we built a load balancer all on our own, only really acts as a competitive differentiator if you're F5 networks or something, not yeah. if you're attempting to sell socks. Yeah, you know, at, at AWS, we called it undifferentiated heavy lifting. And the job is to get as much of that off your plate as possible. Yeah, uh, my term was always solving global problems locally. Same story. Yeah, yeah same story, exactly. Um, so what do you think that means in terms of, you know, I, I, there's this kind of constant debate on Twitter and everywhere else between the uh, Kubernetes folks who think every, you know, you should be managing your own Kubernetes clusters and then you can run them in the data center and on the cloud and uh, folks, and I'm probably on the other side of this argument, which is, you know, just go to so let's, Kubernetes and container management is more like the, the Prius where true serverless is like the Tesla. Uh, what's your, what's your view on that? There are, I think they're aimed at different things. Like if you have an existing app that you want to move into something that's a lot more, I guess, modernized from an architecture perspective, containers are a hell of a lot easier than rewriting the entire thing to benefit serverless. 
if you're writing something greenfield, the idea of going serverless is, the, is usually the right direction for a variety of reasons we need not get into here. Now, this is skewed in the public discourse by the real reason a lot of people get into Kubernetes, which is that they're attempting to cosplay as Google SREs, where we can't all work at Google, but we could use a tool that claims to be what they use inside of Google, only different. Because again, it's not Borg, don't get me wrong. We are, uh, we are the great unwashed. We're nowhere near that special. We have to be able to solve algorithms on a whiteboard and possibly write code in a Google Doc remotely to demonstrate that we are worthy of entering those hallowed halls. But for the rest of us schmooze, Kubernetes is as close to the sun as we're allowed to fly on those wax and winks. I, I, I had an interesting experience going and speaking at KubeCon last year. And it was uh, the thing I was talking about uh, open policy agent, which we use inside of Fugue and is part of Cloud Native Computing Foundation, et cetera. Uh, but I was watching, uh, you know, I'm, my day job does not involve me building and, and making architectural decisions over hand rolled Kubernetes clusters. And I kind of had the assumption going in that there were some agreed upon ways on how to do things beyond just the basics. And what I learned at least a year ago is that there were not. <laughs> that between the uh, authentication and authorization on a transaction level, different whole approaches being used. And that's the equivalent of IAM, in other words. And, and, and that is so central to uh, you know, the, the, the functioning of the system, the design of the system, that I don't really believe there's a ton of kind of portability in in those implementations. They all seem like snowflake implementations to me, at least the ones I was seeing. Everyone is very important that portability, everyone's very clear and portability is super important to them. They wind up build, on day one, building everything that it could be picked up and moved to another cloud provider, which makes them feel way better when they don't pick it up and move it to another cloud provider. You are giving up feature velocity by focusing on a perceived level of agnosticism. Also, if you're not simultaneously actually deploying it to both places, it's like a DR plan. Works in theory, not in practice. Theory, of course, being the name of my staging environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have customers that are that use multiple cloud providers, uh, either through uh, uh, intelligent decisions or uh, on, you know, uh, Google Cloud is really good at data science stuff. Like they're, yeah, they're strong. They are. And um, Azure is really good if you have existing you know, .NET applications, it, it, it works really nicely with the tool stack. Or I'll even take it a step further. Oracle Cloud, jokes aside, their bandwidth pricing is less than 10% of what AWS, GCP, and Azure charge for outbound bandwidth. And those are starting retail prices. Well, we'll negotiate more for heavy debt, for heavy usage. Yeah, so will Oracle. They're not, if, if you have a seriously constrained application in terms of outbound bandwidth, I would suggest potentially holding your nose and considering Oracle Cloud from that perspective. Now, their business practices as a company are abhorrent, but their technology is awesome. Yeah, that's true. Uh, actually, a number of friends of mine from my AWS days are over there now and constantly tell me yeah. how much better their technology is. Uh, okay, we've got a question here. Um, what are your approaches to granting AWS access to other engineers who know very little about how to develop safely and cheaply in the cloud. Not everything can be developed locally. And at least where I work, there's typically a need to give most engineers some cloud access. Uh, is it a better ROI to be stringent and slow de down development or to require some base level cloud training for all engineers who want to access the cloud infrastructure? Uh, I've got some thoughts there, but if you want to take it first, go for it. Sure, I'm never a fan of gating access to AWS. I'm a fan of, you know, maybe don't let these people into your production account till they pass some form of competency exam. But here's a development account where after anything that's spun up, we have uh, we can figure AWS Nuke to run in it. And after anything that's spun up, after seven days, we'll get automatically turned off. It's super hard to wind up going too far down the path unless you're intentionally trying to do things. And most people, unless they work at Facebook, aren't waking up today trying to figure out how to make things worse. So people do I mean well, if you can put the guardrails in that make sense and get out of engineers way to wind up being able to iterate in this environment effectively and thoughtfully, people will learn by doing. I'm not at all opposed to the idea, incidentally, of having people go through some trainings, but understand that not everyone learns the same way. I can sit through training, it goes in one ear, out the other. The way that I learn is by doing and building something. I was never an academic, I was a terrible student, but tell me to build something and I'll do it horribly, but it'll get built. I'm gonna agree 100%. What we do at Fugue, and we tend to hire fairly senior engineers because we're a small team. Right, and we're, we're a startup, we're not a big giant organization or an enterprise, but I would recommend this pattern to enterprises too. Um, 
give new engineers their own dev account and set limits on it. There, don't let them put any production data in there, right? That's obvious, I hope. But in some of the breaches I've read about recently, there was production data uh, used in, uh, in test or staging or even dev environments. Don't ever do that. But set some limits around, like don't let them spin up really expensive EC2 instance types. Um, I would, I would, ca I would caution at one point there. When you say don't ever put production data into a staging environment, a lot of that is going to depend on what the company does and what that production sure. data is. My production and my production data, for example, includes a bunch of public links and my snark that builds out the newsletter. There's no reason in the world for me not to shove that in there. So I want to be careful that and just point out that all of this is deeply nuanced when we're having these conversations, map it to your environment. If you're a bank, an awful lot of what I'm saying may very well not apply in the opposite direction. It, you have to do you. I'm speaking in the best practices, common case sense. Yeah, that's a good point. When, when I said production data, I was really referring to things like customer data mm. or uh, PII data, you know, personal data. Well, look at Mr. Fancy here having customers. <laughs> uh, well, you know, one of the, I won't- Twitter for Pets is gonna have its first customer any day now. What one of the, the you look at the Uber breaches and, and those things were were like uh, I'm sorry, infosec breaches or ethical breaches? Well, they went together at least once or twice, oh. I think. Yeah. I think somebody, yeah. Got, I think somebody got fired and is, is might go to jail for that. All right, we're gonna do one more background and then we'll just go to some QA. All right, this is gonna be a um, anime background. Let's see if we have any anime fans. Uh, one hint, uh, it is the PlayStation probably, Five. I didn't catch the first part, but it doesn't have five in the title. Probably no, the the, the PlayStation anime. Five, the new gaming console from Sony. Oh, PlayStation Five. Uh, you know, I see the family resemblance. They might have had some inspiration there. Anyone? Any? Anyone know or got a guess? I guess not. Let's do. It's not SpongeBob. That was an excellent guess, though. Uh, let's do. Uh, it's not the ISS. All right. Let's do another history of computing. I've left the name on this, so you can't just tell me the name, but you have to tell me kind of what it is. It's a very important computer or device in computing in the history of computing. What is this? The first microservice. Not quite. <laughs> It's the interface message processor. Does anyone know what the, or the imp? Uh, Kyle, okay, no, Dyer got it again. It, it is the very first router for the internet ever made. Um, and a, a bit of trivia about the internet. Uh, the, the, the fellow who's, and his name escapes me right now, uh, who actually came up with the idea, worked for DARPA, but what he was trying to build, he was kind of, uh, lying to them, oh, I'm going to build a network that will survive nuclear war. What he really wanted was more like what we have today without Facebook. He didn't, he didn't see Facebook coming, but he wanted a, uh, a means for all humans everywhere to communicate. Uh, and he got DARPA to fund that with the nuclear war story. But internet is actually short for intergalactic net. That's how he was thinking about it in, in, in the origins of the internet. Uh, oh, and then CloudFront went on to uh, try to impose intergalactic latency levels on it as well. <laughs> All right, Guy had already gotten one, and I missed that. Told you not to guess twice, Guy. Okay, I'm going to do. Uh, let's do a TV show. Somebody's going to get this. Yeah. Okay. I think Steve was first. This is the original Lost in Space. Uh, if you're of my, I'm, I'm, I'm going back before your time, Corey. If you're from my day, you looked forward to watching this getting, when you got home from school. All right. Um, we got just a few minutes left. Does anyone have any, any questions for us you haven't asked? Anything you would like us to, to riff on or chat about? Hey, Josh, this is Drew. Uh, Corey, one thing I, that interests me, I know you, you primarily focus on coming in and helping uh, AWS customers kind of get a handle on their bills and, and bring those down. Do you, do you see uh, those same customers maybe making some pretty big kind of security mistakes as a part, in a, as a part of making their uh, spend mistakes? And, and do you help them or do you point those out and 
and try to point them in the We've right direction. We've started avoiding digging in that direction because it turns out that it becomes enough of a distraction from what they really brought us in to handle that it, it derails the entire conversation. It's one of those, at, at some point, if you have access credentials tied to the root account and don't have a, have the, a multi-factor turned on, that's not great, but if we start down that path and start flagging S3 buckets that are open, for example, it just it turns into a never ending escalating series. At some point to do a serious analysis, we need deeper access than we do to do a bill analysis. And we, we by and large try not to look too deeply at that unless we're explicitly asked to. It, it doesn't play out as well as we would hope. Got it. Gotcha. So from, I'm curious, you keep up really quickly with all the developments going on at AWS. Uh, in recent releases, whether new services or new features of services, have you seen anything from a security perspective that you think is really worth paying attention to that's a new capability? Ask me that question after Andy Jassy's keto at reInvent. Okay. All right. Um... So I, I have enough uh, inside track stuff right now that I'm trying to remember what has been released and what hasn't. So I'm going to shut up and not talk myself into trouble. <laughs> Telling yeah, other don't, people don't secrets doesn't go well. Yeah. Okay. So what's uh, related? Uh, what's one thing that uh, that everyone should be doing to improve their security posture on AWS that that you just commonly see they're not doing? The IAM access advisor is pretty awesome. It lets you scope down permissions because let's not kid ourselves. The way this works always is we're setting up an IAM policy and we're trying to make a thing do something else and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and the logs are useless and don't tell us what the, what the issue is. So we say, hell with it, crank up the permissions and now it works. Well, hell with it, I have a job to do. I'm not going to go back and dial that in. So now that there's a programmatic way of isolating that down, it's way better. I really should practice what I preach and go ahead and do that at some point. Um, another thing that I'm a big fan of is there are really two issues that need to be addressed and people like to conflate them. One is I have access to your account. I can spin a bunch of stuff up and have it mine Bitcoin. The other is data loss or data breach incidents. Yep. I find that the spinning up the, the Bitcoin stuff, secure your access credentials. Yeah, great. Your failure mode there is, well, that was dumb of us. The data piece is way more important. And to do that, I something companies don't do is tiering data, either with tags or something else that discuss, is this subject to PCI? Is this customer data? And then you can wind up narrowing in on that and being much more prescriptive around that. Because if someone steals a bunch of your test data, you probably don't really care. If they steal the content of the payments database, you are really going to care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. We got a question here that uh, I'm not going to, uh, well, it's to all attendees that probably many people uh, would ask, but are afraid to. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, what do I need to know to be secure enough to not look like a total idiot? Uh, well, it, it's hard to tell you where to start. It's a vast field. I think we, we've tried, I'm not trying to do a product pitch. We've tried to do something where you can turn Fugo and point it at your account for free. And we will tell you where you have what we see as issues. And we're, we're pretty thorough about it. Um, unfortunately, like any other, I mean, to me, security is just another kind of engineering. It, it's thinking about the problem space from a different perspective than say functionality or cost optimization. But in the end of the day, what we're all trying to do is build uh, machines and software that are efficient, operate as intended, for whom intended, and nothing else. And security is another way of thinking about that. So it's kind of like asking, uh, what do I need to know about programming uh, to look like I'm not a fool, it's highly variable. But there are ways to kind of look into that without having to immediately and directly confront uh, the complexity of the topic. All right, well, we're coming up at the top of the hour. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending. Drew, do you have, uh, should I bring back up the slides to take us out? I, I just had one more. Um... Oh, sorry, I had one more that I wanted to throw at, at Corey. Uh, one of the things I, I um, read that you said in an in a interview is, you know, thankfully with an unexpectedly large bill, you have a number of options, but you don't get a do-over with a data breach. And, and before we started this, you were saying, you know, oftentimes uh, organizations will kind of rush into the cloud, do a bunch of stuff, and then realize they've got a billing problem, and then they bring you in when it's kind of reached that mess stage. And I think we see that a lot of that with security too. Um, 
I would ask, you know, when is the right time to kind of think about doing it right from a spend perspective and a security perspective? We're probably all going to say, you know, on, you know, day zero or day one. Uh, but, you know, what might you suggest people might do to kind of raise this flag early, like kind of get a, the right kind of attention on, um, you know, making sure you're doing things right from a security or a spend perspective before it gets out of control? Yeah, from the spend side, I think you can you can be too early on spend. When someone is trying to figure out if something is possible, is not the time to bug them with what they're spending. Um, once they start building something toward production, having a cursory review of, huh, that thing is spending, so we're going highly available and it transfers an awful lot of data back and forth between availability zones. That's two cents a gigabyte in perpetuity. That can get really expensive at petabyte scale. Is there, another, is there another method that provides us with that availability without having to cross that boundary? Begins to be the sort of thing that you can look at where it makes sense to do it. But for those of us building out proofs of concept, it doesn't necessarily make sense for me to spend that kind of time on something that is only ever going to see 30 megs a month of data transfer, that my time is worth more than that. So at various points, as you continue to scale and see inflection points, it's worth revisiting. I'm a big fan of going in as companies are starting their cloud migration or cloud migration planning. And okay, minor tweak now as you're thinking about how to put this out here, but it's going to cut your bill in half if you do it. It's easier to change a line on a whiteboard than it is to wind up changing something in production. Yeah, so it really know, depends were, on you. As you were talking, it it, it reminded me that uh, about the the microservice philosophy now. That's it's almost like religion. Everything needs to be a microservice. The mm -hmm. main reason for microservices there are two main reasons for micro for service interfaces. Not all of them should be micro. We're talking about service interfaces and service art style architecture. One is the ability to scale out, and that's usually the main one. And the other is to create separation of concerns by API rather than have everything in one program. But I'm here to tell you that if you believe you need to build a microservice architecture for an application that's gonna have less than 10,000 users, you don't. You just need to write a program that does it in memory on a box. It's much easier to debug. You're not getting into a, uh, 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 distributed application architectures. And if you're doing services, you are doing distributed application architectures. I'll take so it a I step further. The, the real again. value, I agree with what you're saying, but the real value of microservices originally was I have a single repository that's my entire monolith and 5,000 engineers working on it. They're, they're basically a group of engineers is called a merge conflict. How do I solve this? And the answer was, well, microservices, and then you can have small teams if they keep stable interface points. Great, you've solved a political and personal and people problem with this approach. It is not necessarily solving a technical problem. Because some jack wagon gets on stage and says you should do microservices, maybe that's not a compelling enough reason. If you're curious, look into it, but there are arguments for and against. Make sure you understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. Yeah, I'm certain- Especially those things that are hard to change later. We're, if you're doing lambdas, you're doing microservices, right? And we have our own reasons for doing that, having to do with, you know, we burst up to tens of thousands of these things and then burst down to nothing. So th that's, <laughs> a really good way to do that, um, to, to do that kind of scaling without having to pre-provision. But there's a cost to having those API endpoints, just like there's a cost to having those merge conflicts that you're describing. And those API endpoints now have to be maintained, have to be you know, backwards compatible and so on. So just understand what you're getting into and uh, understand what the best techniques are to build the kind of system uh, that you need to build. So there is a great. Yep, another good question here. You know, what's a good gauge of whether or not to have enough staff members dedicated to cloud security? And my spin on that is kind of who owns security in the cloud? Is it the engineer, DevOps? Is it the security teams? And it might, the answer might be different depending on the use case and the organization. It's usually a question for leadership because it's it's the question is really how what is your tolerate what's your appetite for risk how much risk can you tolerate and how much do you want to invest in mitigating that risk it really is going to be a high level negotiation at budget point because what you're really asking is not number of people you're asking how much money can we put into this yes absolutely how much how much money going to either people or technologies. Right. If you bring in new engineers and they look at what you're doing, you want an easy gauge, great. When they look, when you bring in someone new who's uh, basically mid or senior level engineering and they look at what you're doing from either a cloud or a security perspective and the response is, holy shit, that, that's probably a good warning sign that maybe it's time for a little bit more investment. 
But usually that's, that's sort of one of those blatantly obvious blinking light indicators. Figuring out before then is really one for, I guess, a process and people management story. Yeah, that makes awesome. sense. I agree. All right, well, it. we're at the top of the hour. Um, I think we've gotten to all your questions. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. And Drew, why don't you, um, uh, once I get back to where I can share my screen from. Then... Hey, Corey, thank you for joining us today. This was a lot of fun. No, by all means, thank you for tolerating my slings and arrows in equal proportion. We knew what we were getting into. Oh yeah, it's always fun to talk to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And thanks for joining us. And, and thanks everybody out there for, uh, for joining us today and uh, throwing all these questions out. They were awesome. You guys are great. I uh, just want to close The next one out. of these is all on pen testing, but those of us who don't have patience for that will just use a pencil instead. Yeah, uh, pencil testing in your cloud and why that's a really, really bad idea. And uh, you need to pen test your cloud misconfiguration attack surface. Um, December 10th, join us for that. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And then as you can see, we've we've got kind of this growing library of uh, content uh, in, the, in our library. And uh, we will be adding uh, this session to that shortly. So you'll be able to, to tell your friends and come back and watch the reruns because it'll, it'll be better the second time around. Um, thanks everybody, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Corey, thank you, Josh, thank you, Sivia. Thanks everyone. Great session. Cheers. Bye-bye.